Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. I'd like to introduce you to Brooke Sellis. She's the founder and CEO of B Squared Media. B Squared is a digital marketing agency specializing in done for you social media, advertising, and social first customer care management. She's also a social media speaker and companion of the Marketing Companion podcast. She also teaches digital marketing certification course. And Brooke is releasing a new book titled Conversations That Connect soon. Welcome, Brooke. How are you today? Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I really want to hear about your journey because I hear you are a wannabe weather girl <laughs> to doing a thesis on social penetration theory and becoming a digital marketer. Now, that sounds like quite a story. So please tell me <laughs> about your journey to get here. Yeah, so I always thought in high school that I wanted to do the weather. I wanted to be the the weather person on the news. Um, so I went to school uh, for communications and um, didn't end up following that path, ended up following a much different path instead, kind of in the sales and marketing world. And then in 2012, I started uh, B Squared Media based on this concept, Think Conversation, Not Campaign. And it was kind of because of or the seed. There was a few seeds that got planted, but I had done my undergraduate thesis work on the social penetration theory, which is mm -hmm. a terrible name, but a brilliant concept. And it basically says that the way we form relationships with each other is through self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. So long story short, if I like you, I disclose information to you and we go deeper and deeper and deeper, right? There's like a breadth and a depth of conversations. So we can go very surface through all these different topics and the breadth, but depth is what's most important. So when we are, there's four levels of disclosure on the depth. There's cliches, facts, opinions, and feelings. And most conversations happening on social media from brands to consumers live in that cliche-based or that fact-based information for their content marketing. And my book is encouraging um, brands to go deeper and use opinions and feelings to truly connect with their audiences to build better communities and then to converse and convert through social media efforts. Hmm. Can you give me an example of a before and after of what you're talking about? Yeah. So uh, obviously we see a lot of like memes. We see a lot of companies putting out facts about like uh, our, uh, our, I'll give you a financial institution example. So, you know, their content is very fact-based and that's understandable, right? It's a, it's a red tape industry. There's a lot that has to go into approval of content for financial industry uh, content. So it's often very cliche and fact-based. We work with a financial institution in Chicago and um, one of the things they wanted to understand was why, why do our customers have problems with our downtime, right? Every financial institution has downtime where their servers go down. And uh, so we used social listening to kind of see what was happening in the conversations out there among their customers when the downtime happened. And what we found was that 80% of their customers were unhappy about the fact that overdraft protection didn't exist during downtime. So during a planned downtime, if you went over in your account, you would get an overdraft fee, which customers found to be unfair. We took that back to the C-suite, told them what was happening, and they actually changed their banking rules around downtime. And now customers are no longer penalized during banking's planned downtime with overdraft pr protection, they've actually extended kind of a grace period to go through that. So not only did we show their customers that they were listening, but we also instituted change, right? We took the negative and that was a real catalyst for us to understand how to change something so that the customers would become more loyal or more receptive to the brand, which is hard mm -hmm. to do in the financial industry. And they loved it. They were floored because we listened, we we said we were going to do something, and then we actually did it. So we made change that made their lives better. So let me be clear. You found this out through having conversations on social media, correct? 
Uh, this is not like a research project or anything. So tell me exactly how that kind of played out so I can better understand this. And I think this leads into what we're going to talk about here in a minute is more about conversations versus a campaign. Yeah. So we had conversations as the brand. Um, we also had internal conversations, but our team was kind of uh, versed with having those social conversations, like saying like, hey, when we have planned downtime, what are some of the things that you don't like? Or what are the some of the things that you want us to look at and address? So we asked those questions. And then on top of that, we kind of layered insights or social intelligence. We asked directly, but we also looked at some of the conversations that were happening in general during the bank's downtime. So when, when, and peers were having conversations about this downtime with each other, not necessarily to the brand, right? So we looked in both places to kind of understand what that what those conversations were. And then we looked at the sentiment of the conversation, what was positive, what was neutral, what was negative. When we found out that 80% of these negative conversations, both with the brand and with each other, peer to peer, were about this um, overdraft protection not being available, that seemed like an easy solution, or <laughs> at least to the, to the social team it did, right? Obviously we had to take that information quantify it, put it into an anecdote for the C-suite to understand. But they understood that if 80% of the problem could go away just by extending a grace period during this time, that was a very easy fix for them. So they instituted that change. And so when you're having these conversations, these are all public forums. It's not like any private uh, chat or anything at all, right? Uh, I yeah, mean, this uh, is happening right on social channels. Yeah. So what do you say to people that are afraid to say, Hey, look, look, I'm really scared to have negative comments and talked about my brand and my uh, product. My whole philosophy is I want you to be a negative Nancy, right? We have this whole negative connotation with negative things. And I get that. But like, let's pretend that everything people are saying about you is positive. While that may seem like the dream, then you're done. There's no catalyst for change and everything being perfect, right? So if you can actually get over the fact that people are telling you that you aren't doing a good job and actually listen to that information, kind of understand, take the deep dive and understand what is it that we aren't meeting with the customer expectation or customer experience and then figure out how to change that and then do exactly what I just told you. We listened, we heard what you said, we understand how this is a pain point for you and we've changed it. That's going to help people buy into your brand and be more loyal to your brand, which we all know is very difficult to do today. In your experience, and I'm kind of related to what we're just talking about in my mind, how do you identify a super fan versus just a regular fan? Yeah, that's a great question. So we also use social listening to kind of help identify advocates and influencers. And there's a lot of different variables, but you start to see the same names pop up again and again and again in the conversations that are happening with your brand. And assuming that your social media tool or dashboard or your CM CRM connects to your social media channels, you need to start to kind of star those individuals to understand, okay, Brooke is constantly here. She's constantly Constantly giving great feedback to the community. You can also see who's emerging as like what we would call a community leader. So that if you did decide to create a community for the brand, you can go straight to Brooke and say, Brooke, look, we've recognized you as a community manager, a leader for several years now. We're going to start a community and we would love to know if you would like to be one of our moderators of the community. Nine times out of 10, someone like Brooke, who's engaged all by themselves, is going to say yes. And then you've already got a peer kind of leading and moderating your community, which is much better to have like that peer-to-peer -peer going on than the brand to peer. So I'm kind of curious, how often do you find that someone who's actually negative is actually a diamond in the rough to become a super fan? Uh, a lot of times, actually. You know what? I think we have become keyboard warriors, right? We say all kinds of things that we would never say or do in real life. But behind the keyboard and behind the screen, we have this um, ability to <laughs> go there, <laughs> right? In ways that we would never do. And what we find a lot of times with people who complain is that they just want someone to listen and to recognize and to align with them with empathy, 
right? Like, I'm so sorry this happened. That shouldn't have happened that way. That was wrong. Like, it's so hard. You'll notice online looking at conversations, at least how I do, that a lot of brands have a hard time saying sorry or a hard time saying like, that was wrong. We did, that was, that's not how that should have gone. If we can just be open, authentic, transparent, all things we know consumers want because you and I are both consumers, right? It's so much easier to get to trust and loyalty. But there's this big disconnect with brands feeling comfortable or safe, being authentic. And being authentic also means like fessing up when you mess up. (laughs) Right. How difficult or easy is it today to get to trust and loyalty? Hard. It's so hard. And I think that's because if you look at the majority of the content that's out there from brands, right, on social media, where where I'm always talking about social media, just, just... for reference. Um, It's all cliche and fact-based content. And if you look at the social penetration theory, if you look at other social psychology um, theories, that's not how we build relationships. They're staying surface level as the brand, but then expecting the consumer to like trust, love, and want to be their best friends forever. That's not how it works. It's give and take. There's reciprocity that's involved. So brands have to start to move past cliche and back content, start sharing their own brand values, their own opinions and feelings on things. And that way they can get the consumers to share their opinions and feelings back so that you can start to build a relationship the way we, just the way we do in real life, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's no different online. The medium has changed, but the concepts are the same. How much do you think this uh, preponderance of cliches, as you say, that are on social media is a result of how people view social media? For example, you really talk about conversations versus a campaign. And I think what I'm reading into that is social media is not just another method of advertising, correct? Yeah, but that's how brands see it, right? I mean, you can see it in the content that they share. It's all very um, product-related, service-related, buy-my-stuff-related. You know, there's no real connection coming from the brands, which is why they're not getting the connection. It's why their social strategies are suffering, especially now, because it's so noisy. And everyone's in the camp of cliches. Nearly everyone's in the camp of facts. Very few are in the camp of opinions and feelings. So if you want to differentiate, if your strategy is stagnant, this is where you have to go to conversations versus campaigns. And not to say you can't run campaigns too, but if you focus on the conversation, if you focus on the customer, the campaigns are something that can just help supplement that for you. So when you say conversations, what would you say are the three key elements you really try to hone in on to ensure that the, they are maintained in the conversation? It's it's hard, right? It's not easy. So I, I want to be clear that like it's not like you're going to go out today and be like, I heard this podcast and I'm going to go start these conversations and then we're going to all of a sudden be talking about our feelings and opinions by tomorrow and by Monday, everybody's going to love me. It is a long game, right? So you kind of have to start with what are your brand values? And then think about your audience and think about how you can connect their values with your values. I'll give you an example, Patagonia, right? It's an outdoor sportswear type of clothing brand. They're big on climate change, right? That could be seen as a risky topic. However, Patagonia knows that their audience are avid outdoors people. They know that being avid outdoors people, they are also probably supporters of climate change. So when Patagonia talks about their feelings and opinions regarding climate change, they're not turning off their core audience or the people who are actually going to purchase their products, right? They're actually aligning their core values with the core values of their audience, which makes them want to buy their product even more and makes them want to trust and be loyal to them because they share similar values. I think so you're talking about- I think, <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say understanding your own brand values, figuring out how you can connect your values with the values of your audience, and then using conversations to have topics and themes around these values through opinions and feelings. Mm-hmm. So I think what you're saying is actually engage in these conversations to actually humanize the brand. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yes. Because even though marketing is beautiful, I love marketing and I'm a marketer, I still, as a consumer, I'm not like, oh, look, there's Wendy's. I really want to connect with that brand. Right? I mean, maybe some people feel that way, but, and I think Wendy's is great and snarky and hilarious, but 
But I'm not setting out to be like, oh, I want to be best friends with Nordstrom or Walmart or whatever it is. You know, I'm when I do reach out to the brand for support or acquisition type questions, like pre-purchase questions, which is happening more and more through social media, I'm looking to make a connection with a human on the other side, not even a bot, right? I'm hoping to connect with a person so that they can empathize with me and then solve my problem. What do you think is the real power behind social media? Exactly what we're talking about. The, the power is that we can align with one another based on our values, which is what we do in real life, right? It's how we form relationships in real life, but we can do it through this medium that allows us to do that at scale. It's just that nobody's doing it or very few are doing it, you know? So I want more people to embrace this idea of building loyalty, building community, building relationships, whatever you want to call it at scale, but you have to put in the work to, to get something out of it. I think what you're saying is a very interesting point because you can not only do it at scale, but at the same time, you're doing it in a personal manner. So part of that scale is others are seeing this conversation that you're having with an individual. And many of them feel like, hey, the, I've been in their shoes. So the way this brand is treating this person is the way I'd like to be treated. So it's really, I think, a combination of individual and uh, at scale at the same time. Would you agree? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, because you have a captive audience on social. When you are the brand speaking to someone, right, on social, as long as we're talking about like on the the channel, not through DMs or private messages, um, everybody's watching. People see that and they're looking at how you respond. And I'm sure you've seen this because I see it a lot lately. If somebody doesn't respond the right way or responds in a bad way or doesn't respond at all, people pick up, they take notice, and then that information gets shared out over and over and over. So you're telling people immediately with your response or non-response what kind of brand you are and what your brand values are. And do these conversations differ by platform? And if so, how? They do. They really do. That's such a great question because, um, you know, a lot of times when we're helping people prepare for social-led customer care, which, by the way, again, it doesn't just cover post-purchase. We're also helping pre-purchase questions get answered. So if I'm in a buying moment and I go to a, um, a company like Epson and I say, hey, Epson, I'm looking at your printer and this other company's printer and they have the exact same features and they're the exact same price. Why should I buy yours? If that brand comes in right away and says, hey, Brooke, great question. They are exactly the same. Ours has these XYZ benefits that uh, the other brand doesn't have. And also I can give you a code for free shipping today. Boom. You can, you know, you've just social sold and now you've through your conversations on social media have collected a conversion, right? You've collected money or revenue for the brand. So, um, I just want to make that point clear because I think a lot of people think that when I talk about social ed customer care, we're only talking about post-purchase, but we're talking about the entire digital journey happening mm -hmm. on social media channels. So I think it's important to know where those conversations are happening and they're not happening everywhere. So the whole be everywhere approach doesn't work because you're going to realize the channels where you're getting more questions, whether they're support or pre-purchase. Um, and that's where you should focus, right? You don't have to be everywhere. If you get one support question or one acquisition question on TikTok in a month, that doesn't mean you need to go be active on TikTok to help out your customers. You know what I mean? It, it's like, <laughs> find the areas where most of those conversations are happening and, and be there. Go there. Meet the customer where they are. So how do the conversations differ, let's say, on a TikTok versus Instagram? Uh, Twitter and Facebook, just to give me some examples of how they all kind of differ. Yeah, what we see a lot on Twitter, for instance, is people talking about the brands but not tagging them. So it's a lot of brand complaining or like when a brand says something really off off the wall, right? Off color. People are like virally like sharing out, oh my God, can, did you see what so-and-so said or did? Um and uh, on Facebook, it's a lot of complaining as well, but direct, usually within a within a post, you know, uh, in the comment section or sometimes through a DM. And on Instagram, we see a lot of uh, similar ways that um, 
that people use Facebook. So within that post, there's a complaint or a question or they use DM. And that happens a lot on Twitter too. Um, but I find on Twitter, there's a lot more what we call untagged moments, which is why social listening is so important. So we can still see when the brand is mentioned, even if we're not tagged, if that makes sense. So... I think a lot of people struggle with this uh, dilemma. Should I be in all the socials? But I think what you just said a minute ago is be more focused. And uh, but you know when you start out, maybe some of those conversations haven't uh, really uh, materialized. So how do you decide? And uh, how how do you guide a client in terms of which channels to really be on? Yeah, I think this all goes back to your social strategy. You know. How are you using social media to tie back to your business goals? First and foremost, if you don't know that, it's time to go back to the drawing board and figure that out. And then once you know what your social media goals are and how they tie to your business goals, then coming up with what are the key performance indicators that are going to help us understand how we're meeting those goals, right? How are we successful? Is it clicks from social over to our website? Is it return on conversation? Is it shares of our blog posts through social media? What are those KPIs? And then attached to those are the metrics that you'll actually look at. So you can start to benchmark some of those things and then plan for goals every month, right? Compared to the benchmark and then see if you meet or miss that benchmark or you meet or miss that KPI. And that should tell you how, how you're doing. But um, I do not believe that you should be everywhere. In fact, I think that's one of the biggest um, mistakes with social media is that we're so focused on the platform and not the consumer. And we need to flip that around. If you can learn how to have these conversations and how to live in more of that feeling and opinion content through social, um, you can you can really dominate on any platform. But again, you want to go where your customers are and meet them there. So I think you know you've got to know your business goals, your social media goals, how you're going to track all of that. Find out where your audience, who your audience is, where your audience lives, and then go meet them there. And I, it's not everywhere. I promise you. <laughs> what are some common mistakes companies make in setting social goals? And then once you talk to them, say, you know, that's not really what you need to do. You should be doing this. Can you give me an example or two? Yeah, I think the number one goal still, which is mind boggling, is uh, the whole like follower thing. Like we want to have 10,000 followers in the next three months. And I'm like, no, that's not the point. I would rather you have 100 followers, but all 100 of those people are engaging in these conversations, giving you feedback. Social media, if used correctly, is like the biggest, best and really free, quote unquote, minus the time, right? Focus group out there. You have all of this information and social intelligence at your fingertips if you just use social correctly. So it's not about having 10,000 followers or 100,000 followers. It's about having 100 followers who are all actively engaged with your brand. When their values align with your values, you're going to have better conversations and you're going to convert more easily. So um, I think that's mistake number one. I think mis mistake number two is that as we talked about earlier, a lot of companies are still using social media as a broadcast platform, right? It's all like, buy my stuff. This is on sale. Woo. <laughs> you know, it's like the flashing neon sign or like the car, the car guys, you know, those balloon stick figures that are like floating up and down. And that's just, it's not going to work. It's not how we as consumers, right, putting on our consumer hat, use social media. And I think also, you know, brands tend to, a lot of brands tend to schedule like the same exact content to go out on the same exact, you know, at the same exact time on every platform. How is that enticing me to follow you in more than one place? It's not, you know, so I think we're still using social in a one, at a 101 level when, you know, you can move this to this like 301 level and do a lot better. And, and actually it's more efficient. You have, you can put out less content it's more meaningful, making more connections and hopefully converting more. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I want to delve into this further because I think you're making a very interesting point here. I'm almost hearing you say that social should be seen as an intelligence tool. And when used properly and having these conversations, that's what actually leads to a higher conversion. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. 
Yes, yes, you're exactly right. You have all of this. Let's also really quickly talk about like the cookie apocalypse that's coming, right? Google has said we are taking away sometime at this year third party cookies, which is little snippets of code that track your device throughout the internet. It's really how advertisers make the most money. So we also provide advertising. Retargeting is how most of our ad campaigns um, get the most conversions. That little retargeting snippet of code is going away. You have have to have a plan for collecting first party data. You know how you can collect first party data on social media with conversations, <laughs> you know? So you don't have to be as scared about some of these technology changes and privacy changes that are coming if you're using social for conversations versus campaigns. Can you give me an example of where, you know, you've found an insight through this intelligence gathering conversation and how it really changed the trajectory for a company or a product? Yeah, so I have a great example of, we work with a luxury appliance brand and uh, they have, you know, it's a luxury brand, so their machines are very expensive. They released this very expensive cappuccino machine and I can attest it is worth every penny because I've had several cappuccinos from it and it's amazing. (laughs) However, you know, usually when you release a, lo- a new product online, the chatter that's happening is all positive, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this new machine and the cappuccinos are amazing. It's like you're sitting in a cafe in Italy, you know? But what we saw was some of that positive, but we saw a lot of negative chatter too. And when we dug into that negative chatter to try to find out what people were having issue with, it was the filter in this mm. cappuccino machine. They couldn't figure out how to change the filter. So we went back to the client and we said, you know, people are having a really hard time figuring out how to change the filter. You know, what kind of information or videos do you have on this? And they were like, oh, it's like on page 437 of the service manual. That That's where you can find out how to change the filter. It gives like step-by-step instructions. And we were like, no, absolutely not. You're very you know, luxury customer that just spent all this money doesn't want to flip to page 447 of the service manual to figure out how to do this. Let's make a video and put it on the product page. That way, whenever they have this question and they Google it, that video pops up. But also when people are complaining through, um, you know, these social conversations, we can give them a link to that video and show versus tell. And over a six month period, once they released that video, we saw not only that negative sentiment went down, but positive sentiment went up. And when you see a lot of uh, peer to peer recommendations about a product go up or be talked about, right? The share of voice grows on social. More often than not, we see a direct correlation of conversions or more people buying that product because a friend told you how amazing it was. So that's one way we, you know, use the intelligence that we gathered through conversations to go back and, and create a creative solution to, you know, changing the narrative. We use the voice of the customer and that social intelligence to change the narrative from positive to, I'm sorry, from negative to positive. So when you're getting those peer-to-peer recommendations and more positive that's where you're starting to build what we talked about earlier, that goal of trust, correct? Yes. And it's a great way to capture user-generated content. So as the brand, if you're listening in this kind of way, there are plenty of people who are talking about you in a, in a, in a good way, but not actually tagging you, right? So if you're using social listening, if you're using social intelligence tools to listen in a, into all of these conversations, you can start to see when people are mentioning you in a positive way, not necessarily tagging you, reach out as the brand and be like, hey, oh my gosh, thank you so much for this glowing review. Do you mind if we share this on our social channels? Nine times out of 10, that person's going to say yes. But as that person, think about it. You didn't tag the brand. The brand showed up, told you thank you, asked if they could highlight you. So all of a sudden now you've realized that the brand's listening. You've gotten a thank you. You've been acknowledged. You've been recognized. And now they're asking to make you a pseudo celebrity by sharing your information out on their pages. You know what I mean? Like it's Mm -hmm. not hard but so few people are doing it. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about insights and I've heard you use the term uh, when we talked before about stacking. Tell me uh, about insights and stacking. I think that's quite interesting what you were telling me about that. Yeah, so this is actually a celebrity jewelry brand that we worked with. And uh, they came to us with a project to help understand their audience a little bit better. 
um, on social. And we said, well, who is your audience? To, you know, who do you think they are? And they said, well, we think that uh, we call our audience the girl. That was their term for their audience. And they said, you know, based on our research, the girl is 18 to 24. And we said, okay, how did you arrive at the girl? You know, how did you come to understand that this was your audience? And they said, well, we looked at all of our social media followers on the channels that we use. And the majority of uh, our followers on social media are 18 to 24 and, and, and identify as a woman. And we said, okay, that's a good start, but it's not telling the whole story, right? So what we did was we took that social media follower information we stacked it with social listening data, our social listening intelligence, which showed us that, um, you know, not only who was following the brand, but who was talking about the brand, who was talking mm -hmm. about the products. And then we actually took our paid media data, right? Who's actually coming through and converting on their website through e -com from our social media ads and social media posts. And we stacked all of that information together. So social media followers, people talking about the brand and products, plus their paid media audience. Um, and what we found was that the girl, I'm doing air quotes, um, was actually a woman. She was 34 to 45. That was their true audience. Those were the people who were not only following the brand, but interacting with the brand, having conversations with the brand, and buying the product. Mm. So that necessitated a new marketing plan because the marketing messaging needed to change because they weren't talking to a younger audience. They were actually talking to an older audience. Mm. So that's how we stacked. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually also use social media to test messaging or does it actually work the other way where you get messaging from your conversations that goes into ads? That's another great question. We actually love mining the conversations that are happening online and then taking what the words that the consumer use and using that in advertising or in, in our content marketing messages because there's another social psychology concept called mirroring, right? So as we grow up, we learn by mirroring people, right? We see the way that they pick up their fork when they eat or the way that they pick up their pencil and write. And we mirror that ourselves as we're learning. So if we can mirror and use the words and the phrases that consumers are using and our brand messaging, we can actually get people to align with us a little easier because it doesn't sound like the corporate brand posting this. We're using their terminology, their words. We're saying it the way the consumer are saying it. So it makes it a lot easier to digest, right? It doesn't sound like corporate Corporate speak. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I would think in those situations, the impact is considerably more than not when you're doing mirroring. Is that true? Yeah, I'll give you an example here too. So early on in the pandemic, um, we were all using the word coronavirus. That's what everybody was using, right? That's how we talked about COVID. Now, as I just said, we say COVID or COVID-19 or the pandemic. And what we did through social listening is we were really watching this closely because obviously it was a big thing that a lot of brands were having to address. Mm -hmm. And we looked at how the consumer language changed. And as soon as we started to see that coronavirus wasn't the word anymore, that it was COVID-19, COVID or the pandemic, we went back to our clients and said, hey, look, don't use coronavirus anymore in your messaging about COVID because you're going to sound off off base, right? Because the consumer is now saying COVID-19 or COVID. Mm. So we need to mirror that word choice in our copy. Interesting. Interesting. So speaking of COVID, what kind of impact has that had on social media? Uh, it's been negative. <laughs> so I'm excited because there's so much area for change, right? But it, I mean, more and more people have used social media through the pandemic. More and more people have gotten um, uh, more trusting of purchasing through social media, purchasing online. So there's been some real positive things. But a lot of people have also gotten real, really negative on social media because there's supply chain issues, there's shipping issues, we've got issues, there are labor mm -hmm. issues, right? So we've seen an uptick in complaints, 
to brands on social, which is why I think it's so important for brands to think about how they're going to address the customer support they offer through social channels because more and more people are now going to those channels to ask questions or complain versus mm -hmm. emailing or picking up the phone. So what do you see are the opportunities and threats moving forward on the horizon for social media, digital marketing? I think, yeah, just what I just said, you should really be looking at what kind of questions, either acquisition questions, so pre-purchase or post-purchase support questions that you're receiving as a brand online and make a plan for addressing those. I think the other thing is response time. You know, when we pulled our clients, we said, how much of the social chatter that's happening on your social channels do you think is acquisition based? Meaning mm -hmm. how many people, how many, how much of that content do you think is people coming to the brand and saying like, help me make a purchase with you or help me decide if I want to purchase from you. And our clients said zero to 5%. And we actually started tagging all of the conversations that came in to all of our clients with acquisition or retention. If it was a support pre-purchase question or a support post-purchase question. And some of our clients have had upwards of 40%. 40% of the conversation coming into the brand on social was acquisition, people trying to purchase from the brand. I think that's part of what we're seeing because of the pandemic. So you, you need to look at what's happening, understand how much of it is acquisition, how much of it is support, make a plan for meeting people there, and then make sure that your response times are as fast as possible because we know that consumers expect a response on social within an hour or less. So how can you meet people where they are? Because if you're one of those who's like got the 40% acquisition conversation happening, you're talking about a lot of sales that you could be making if you're there quick and answering people quickly and thoughtfully and with empathy. Hmm. What are your thoughts on the impact of augmented reality? Or is the new term, I should ask you, because you're in these conversations, is it metaverse? Is it, is it change from uh, augmented reality to metaverse? Isn't, it, isn't that one and the same or no? I mean, yeah, yeah. And Metaverse isn't new either. I don't if you if any of you remember like Second Life or Sims, like the Metaverse isn't new. So we just find way marketers. I'm blaming us, right? Marketers find way of packaging it and making it new, but it's not really. <laughs> and you know, I think VR, meta, augmented really, whatever you want to call it, is going to be important for shopping. So one of the big areas that we've seen by leaps and bounds increase on social is like social media shopping, social commerce, conversational commerce, which happens through like uh, voice apps or, you know, a WhatsApp, um, direct purchasing. So I think shopping is really going to change as we know it. Uh, if you look at the younger generations, they don't like to go in store to purchase. They like to purchase online. So I think that whole world is going to just blow up how we're used to shopping um, and make it a cool new space for being online. But that's another reason why you have to think about your customer care because even though we're shopping online, we still expect like the store associate, quote unquote, right? Your, your social person to be there to answer those questions. Like, does this come in a different color? Do you ship to Canada? Do you have it in an XXL? They want those questions answered right then because they're in the buying moment. And if you're not available to help them and meet them where they are in the moment of purchase, you're going to lose out probably to someone else. Hmm. You know, you made me think of something interesting. I've had a lot of conversations on this podcast about customer experience, CX, and employee empowerment, and a lot of these things. But I'm curious, how much of customer experience is actually managing social media conversations well? I think it's moving that way. Because like I said, what we've seen is less and less people want to use email or phone for these support questions and they want to go to email. And as we see these younger generations come into buying power, I think that will only become more and more the thing. No one's going to pick up the phone. No one's going to email. They're just going to go straight to Twitter or wherever and complain or ask the question. Um, so I think, you know, to transform along with all of these other digital changes that are happening, if you truly want to focus on CX, social media and social led customer care should be a part of uh, your budget, a big part of your budget, especially for brands who 
sell any kind of e-commerce or retail type products, right? Because we know that that's where the consumers are going. I'll give you an example. I have a, I have a client in Chicago who does custom fencing, like wrought iron fencing for like backyards and c- mm-hmm. custom playgrounds. Mm-hmm. They're actually moving to an e-com model because more and more people through the pandemic are fine with with purchasing and buying those products, which normally they came out to like, you know, the site and like looked on the playground or looked at the fencing. Mm -hmm. Um, Now they want to buy it online. Now they know somebody has to come out in person and set it up, but they're fine making those purchases online. And I think more and more people are moving in that direction. So even if you sell something like custom playgrounds and fencing, you might have an opportunity to become an e-commerce business and sell online. And if you are selling online, you've got to be able to support your customers there too. And that's where some of the augmented reality stuff could actually help as well. Yes, you can play on the playground, right? Yeah, right. Through AR versus coming to the showroom and doing it in person. So what are some friction points you're still seeing in the shopping experience that customers are still frustrated with and you think you're going to change? Response times. It it hurts my heart because it it seems like such an easy fix. You know, we're spending so much money. I think we see year after year that content marketing budgets are increasing again, you know, for brands and marketers. Um, but we're it's it, we're pouring all of this money into cliche in fact content. We're not pouring any of that money into having someone available, whether it's a bot and humans or all humans or however you want to you know plan it out based on on your needs and your brand and your budget. Um, we're just missing the mark with response yeah. times. You you know I, I I have a lot of these examples in the book of people in the buying moment reaching out to a brand through social saying like I'm ready to like put push purchase but such and such is happening. Mm. They never got a response. A week later they're still trying to purchase from this brand and they're like hey I I tagged you a week ago and I never heard anything and they're still not getting a response and it just it really hurts my heart because I feel like what a miss. Yeah, what a miss on something that is not that difficult. Right. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask you my last question. Who in the world of digital marketing, social media marketing, would you love to have lunch with and why? Oh, man. That's such a tough one. You know, I think I would actually love to talk with the two social psychologists who came up with the social penetration theory. Um, Altwin and Taylor are the two social psychologists. And I would just love to, you know, this was back in the 70s, by the way, when this theory was. So there was no such thing as Facebook or social media. So I would love to have lunch with them and just see what they think about my theory on using their theory through a different medium. And I'm just I'm sure the conversation would be mind blowing because they would be mind blown about social media, but also I'm sure they would lend a lot of insights to, you know, what's happening and how to build better relationships through social. Well, I think it's interesting. You're talking about these theories, but if you think about it, it's these theories apply in the real world or online. Right. And I think if you really think about the real essence of the internet, it's really about connecting people. Yes, it is, but we're not using it that way. And that's why I think I get so frustrated with our industry because the answer is right there. It's ripe for the taking and yet so few people are taking it. Yeah, well, I think more and more people should have conversations. I've enjoyed this conversation. I thank you very much for uh, all the insights and uh, tidbits of, uh, I think, added deeper knowledge that I have now with social media. So I want to thank you, Brooke. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening.